So today I thought we'd have a closer look at one of the Almost Aviation kits and then I think what we'll do is put one together uh, just show you what's involved in that. This is the GPS kit and uh, if you just, I'll just give you, I don't know if you can see that uh, I'll go through just what you get in the box um, first thing is approximately 30 meters of wiring this is color coded so we've got black, red green and yellow. I'll say why that doesn't have to be colour coded, just makes it easier in the assembly. Um, we've got the main square buttons for the GPS controls. We've got two red ones for the zoom in and out. We should have two yellow ones as well, sorry green ones as well, for the um, frequency swapping. These are the rotary encoder controls. For the rotary encoders we've also got knobs separately, so we've got three grey knobs and two black ones. What else? We've got the two black round push buttons also for the, uh, for the push cursor and swapping between the nav and com radios on the left control. We've got one push button lock up latchable for the nav ident. Uh, I usually use a red one, this is a black one, didn't have a red one to hand. We've got the Leo button and controller board, obviously that's a major part of the kit. We'll get a closer look at that later, it's in the packet, it's an anti-static bag at the minute. We've got a bunch of cable ties, we've got the hardware for mounting. You don't have to use this hardware, this is 6 30mm uh, screws and the cop washers. They look pretty cool when they're used to mount the panel. But that depends on how you choose to mount it. You can use shorter screws and still use the cop washers. We've also got a couple of machine screws in there for holding together these two babies. These are the, um, oh, we've got some heat shrink tubing as well for the soldered connections. These are the two acrylic sheets, of course. We've got two of these. We make a sandwich, you'll remember. So the rear one has some larger holes cut out to um, accommodate the components. And of course these have got protective film on at the moment, so we'll take that off during the assembly process. And that is the kit. So what we're going to do next is have a look at what you need to do to put that together. So we're going to build the kit. Um, I'm going to go through the steps that you need to complete to make your kit into a finished panel. So let's get a couple of these components out. So the first thing you're going to need to do is to cut the wire basically. We've got uh, as much wire as we need, but we've got to cut this up into 50 centimetre lengths. 50 centimetres is a good length, half a metre, to begin the construction. What will happen is when you've made the finished panel you're going to bundle all the wires up together and they're going to come out um, at one end of the panel or so, something like that. So, so some of the wires are going to be over long and you'll chop them off to, to make a nice neat bundle and then strip all the ends before connecting them into the terminals of the control board. I've, I've prepared a few wires already so um, I've got a representative set here. I've got some um, well, let's start with a basic switch. For wiring up a basic switch, most of the switches on the board are like this one. It's a push to make switch. Uh, it's got two terminals on, connect a wire to each terminal. Uh, one of them's ground, one of them's a signal. And what we're going to do is color coding. We're going to conventionally use black for all the earth connections, all the ground connections. For the regular switches, we're going to use red for the signal co connection. So Let's just go ahead and do that. We'll do this one switch. Um, the idea is you strip the end, you attach it to the terminal, and ideally you solder it. And I'm saying ideally. What I think I'll do is I'm actually going to build up two of these panels. There is a way to do this solderless if the idea of soldering is too intimidating for you, which it shouldn't be. Hopefully this will demystify it. Uh, what you need to do the first is to strip the end of the wire, probably by about a centimetre or a centimetre and a half, uh, now I'm using a wire strip here. This was from, uh, I do recommend, you know, there's going to be a lot of 
wire stripping in this project and uh, if you're going to do it you know the old-fashioned way with a pair of scissors trying not to cut the thing or pen knife or something like that you're going to get frustrated very quickly this cost about $6.95 or $7.95 from Maplin's this is a cutter and a stripper and it's an automatic one it's kind of a nice little thing uh, it will do different thicknesses of wire all you do is you put it in the jaws like that you just pull it uh, and, it, and it strips the wire automatically so uh, if I just do that again I'll do it with the uh, the red wire as well this is the signal wire for this um, particular switch I'll just show you the switch again this is uh, on the close-up camera so we've got the two terminals, black wire to one, red wire to the other. You'll notice the terminals got holes in, which is kind of useful. We'll see that in a second. So the next thing we're going to do, and this is whether you're going to do it solder, soldering the joints or not. You we just want to twist things together so we've got a nice uh, threadable bit of wire. We're just going to simply start by threading it through the eye on the terminal. And uh, could probably do with being slightly longer here, but uh, it doesn't really matter. So if you put it around in a hook there and kind of twist it on like that. We've got a joint that you know could be ready to go like that. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to, just as a demonstration, we're going to solder that joint up. You get all sorts of uh, fancy pieces of equipment for supporting your soldering. Uh, like this one, it's called a helping hands or something, it's got some crocodile clips on and a bit of a articulated thing. You don't need any of that really to be honest. Um, what you've got to do is make sure the component doesn't move while you do the dirty on it. So what I've done is I've just uh, plonked it on there with something heavy on top of it. We've got the wire stretched out and just again something resting on top of the wire. And all we're going to do is we're going to take this soldering iron, this is a very cheap soldering iron again from Maplin, this is a 30 watt soldering iron, and uh, a bit of solder. The idea is we're going to heat up the tag on the component just by resting the soldering iron on it, and when it gets hot enough we're going to just touch the solder to the wire or the tag in the vicinity of the, where we want the joint, and it'll melt. There it goes. Make sure we don't move that for a couple of seconds until the joint stabilises. And, and there it is. There's a solder joint. Very secure. Uh, it's not going anywhere. Uh, it's as simple as that. Um, the only downside is to build a kit like this with completely soldered joints. You've got to do that 55 times for the GPS and 59 times for the autopilot. That's a lot of stripping twiddling, soldering, but there's nothing hard about it. So what we'll do is uh, we'll do the other one, which is the signal wire for this particular switch. There it goes. And that's it, you can, uh, you can leave it at that if you want, but I mean, to finish that off, ideally what we do is we take some, uh, I've already cut these, some heat shrink, tubing which is just very thin plastic tubing this is uh, two and a half millimeter or three and a half millimeter I think and what you do is you just slide it over the the wire uh, and snug it up down over the solder joint and we'll do one on the other side as well and the idea here is just to insulate the joint really now there's, there's no real chance of anything touching anything else and short circuited so there's no real need to do this uh, but it makes for a nice tidy finished joint now what you have to do here is um, the clues in the name is called heat shrink tubing so what you do is you apply heat to it and it shrinks to half its size and you apply heat using uh, something like this this is actually a paint stripper gun it uh, just generates heat for stripping paint, but you can use a hairdryer. If you've got a hairdryer, uh, if you don't have a hairdryer, you can use anything source of heat. A, a cigarette lighter probably would work as well. Or... But anyway, all you do is you you direct the source of heat at it for a couple of seconds. There we 
turn it around a bit. And that. Tubing shrinks right against the joint, gives you a nice tidy finished joint and uh, you're good to go. Now when you come to connect this up to the controller board, in principle all that matters is for this switch you connect one of these wires to, the, to a signal input, any signal input, and one of the wires to any ground input. Um, so you don't need to distinguish between them. In practice, because these wires are all going to be bundled together, you can't tell the signals from the ground, which is why we're using different uh, colours. So if, they were all, if we used red for both terminals on this, for example, um, we wouldn't know which of the 30-odd uh, red wires that were coming out of the bundle at the other end were signals and which were ground. So if we know all the black ones are grounds, we can just connect the black ones to any of the ground inputs. You know, that's essentially all you need to know to be able to do this, but uh, we got a couple of the, well, got a, we got five, in fact, of the rotary encoder switches. So the rotary encoders, uh, again, we've got tags on them that we solder on. These ones don't have holes in them, so they're going to be slightly less convenient to do. This unit has got two different components in one package. We've got the rotary encoder itself, which is uh, effectively effectively works like a switch when we turn it to the left and a switch that when we turn it to the right. That's what these three pins here are for. We've got a common ground, so we've got two signal wires, that's for left and right, or it might be right and left, I don't know which is which. The middle one is the common, so we want to connect a black wire to the middle terminal of this threesome. We're then going to use a yellow wire to connect to the signals uh, for the left and right of the knob. And the reason for that is we want to be able to distinguish the rotary encoder signals from the regular push switch signals at the other end. And that's because we've got to connect them to adjacent inputs on the button board. So for this component we connect them to one, inputs 1 and 2, or 3 and 4, or 5 and 6, or 31 and 32. Turn that over, we've also got another component which is the central push switch, when you push it it clicks, uh, and that gives us two other terminals. We wire those up exactly the same as the switch we've just done, with a, well, a black wire for the ground, doesn't matter which, which one we connect the black wire to. Now we could put a red wire, if we want to be consistent with this switch, to the signal, but again we're going to use a different colour, we're going to use a green wire for the signal coming from the central push switch. And the reason for that is because we actually probably want to connect all the push switches signals together because they're all going to do the same thing. They're all going to be the shift function for when we push and turn a knob. Um, this is all explained at great length in the construction manual or in the ebook if you've got that same deal. Um, but all you need to know is that's what, and again, there's an addendum to that uh, you can download from the Almost Aviation Forum, that, uh, a wiring addendum which, which explains all this colour coding. It's probably slightly more coherently than I am here. Uh, <laughs> uh, same deal, we're going to take the wires, we'll, we'll wire one of these up, and uh, hopefully you can see this on the close up. We're going to strip the wires, um, again, one and a half to two centimetres, we're going to strip off the end. Again, start by twisting the ends of the wire together. Now because there's no uh, holes in the terminals here, we're going to, it's going to be slightly more, what I'm just thinking is if I, I'm going to separate these tags very slightly by, now don't do too much bending backwards and forwards of these tags because they will take so much of that and then they'll snap off. What I tend to do is I've got a paper clip here and rather than bend this around the tag, bend it around this paper clip, make a loop like that. Now that loop's going to be slightly too narrow for the tag so then we just like um, go back a kind of a half a turn or something, open it up a little bit and you should find that that sits over the top of that spiky 
terminal fairly easily. So again, I'm, I'm trying to put it where I want it, put something on top of that, maybe using a clothes peg here to just hold it in place. I'm going to put something heavy over the component at the other end. Same deal, just going to heat up the, um, the tag and or the wire, apply the solder to it, get a nice blob, let it stabilise. So just fast forwarded a bit, I've attached all the other wires to the rotary encoder control. Um, hopefully you can see that in the close up. And I've done the heat shrink as well. So we've got a nice tidy package. Uh, all those joints should be perfectly good to go. And again, because we've got the colour code in, the, the one last thing we need to do is uh, because obviously we're going to have five rotary controllers, so five pairs of yellow signal wires. And we do need to be able to distinguish between pairs because, as I said, for each rotary control they need to go on adjacent inputs. So we're just going to take another piece of heat shrink tubing and slip it over the two yellow wires. Now, don't you don't want to heat shrink this right away. And the reason is because... Uh, you don't quite know where these wires are going to come out in the bundle um, and so you might cut them back eventually and what you want is you, you want this heat shrink to be quite close to the end just so that when you at the control end you, you can as I say identify the pairs so just leave it on there for now and when you get around to making the wire bundle at the end um, you can shrink those up uh, I mean, you could use a bit of tape or something just doesn't have to be heat shrink it's just quite handy to use that so there you go, I mean that's it, if you can do that, and I would say anybody can do that, with a bit of attention to detail, you just need to do it lots of times, and that's the construction, that's the only real construction part, apart from printing the graphics and getting the graphic insert registered nicely between the two acrylic panels, which we'll come on to. Now having said that, not everyone's comfortable, even after that demonstration, I would say, with the idea of soldering the switches up. So I'm going to show you an alternative that you can use, and uh, it's almost the same, just missing out the soldering step. <laughs> um, so if we get another switch, let's do this for a red switch. Um, well, so we need a red wire signal, black wire for ground. We're going to do exactly what we did before. We're going to thread it through the hole. We're going to make a nice firm... Now if you're not going to solder these it's important to make this uh, tail long enough so that you get a nice firm wrap on the... Um, so, so that wires, you know, it's not going anywhere really. And uh, we're going to do the same with the black wire. And then we're not going to solder it. What we're going to do is we're going to take two pieces of heat shrink. We're going to put them on like we did before. So the heat shrink's over the tags. The wires are nice and secure. And what we're going to do is we're going to heat shrink that tubing in place. Do it from both sides, make sure we get a good even and that's it, no soldering, but we've got nice um, tight secure joints that we should be able to use without a problem. I will just demonstrate that for the purposes of illustration by stripping the other two ends. I'll get the multimeter. All this does is when there's a direct connection between the two probes we get a beep. So I'm going to connect this, these probes to the 
ends of the wires. And if we push the switch, there you go. And we wiggle it about. No problem with that. Uh, no soldering. Just a little note on the rotary encoders. If you're going to do the solderless method, you will have to innovate slightly because the tags don't have holes in them. So to make a secure connection, what you're going to need to do is, although I said don't, you know, don't be tempted to bend these tags around because they're quite fragile. You will have to actually bend a little hook in the end of the tag. I've done, I've done most of them here. And these ones are nicely finished, but uh, if you look, this one I've just I've put the wire on. I haven't yet completed it with the shrink, heat shrink. So I've created the little wire loop using the uh, bending it around the paper clip as I did before. It's ready to slip on the tag. So I'm going to put it onto the tag. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this uh, pair of long nosed pliers and carefully just bend a U-shape in the end of the tag. Um, try not to put any pressure on the component end of the tag for fear of snapping it off. And then press it down. So we've kind of crimped that uh, wire in place and it's ready for the, the heat shrink. And then we're going to shrink it. And there we go, we've got a nicely solder free rotary encoder. That's good to go. Alright, so we've got the components wired up, so the next part of the jigsaw is to work on the panels themselves. So we have here the two acrylic sheets, these are the um, acrylic sheets to make the GPS Plus, don't forget. Uh, the way we do this, we've got a sandwich, so we've got uh, front sheet, rear sheet, and in between we put the graphics, which we have to print out. We can print this on a laser printer or an inkjet printer. My inkjet cartridge was running out so that one didn't come out too good. <laughs> but uh, thankfully the laser's on standby and we've got a very good quality print out there. I'm going to use a single sheet. If you're going to hope to make a backlit panel you might want to use uh, two sheets as I've described in the ebook, just to get the density. This is 80 GS, uh, sorry 100 GSM, HP, I don't know, super white paper or something, but it's quite hefty, it's good, uh, we're only going to use one sheet anyway in this application. We can do the initial stage without removing the protective films from the acrylics, we don't need to see through them, uh, and the reason for that is we've got crosshairs marked for each of the centres of the holes, so we, as long as we can see the crosshairs through the holes, we should be good to go. And I'm positioning in particular using the six peripheral screw holes and also I've got two screw holes which we're going to be interested in in the immediate future because these are the two screws that are going to hold the two well the, the sandwich together so I'm not really satisfied with this in terms of lining it up accurately the protective films are still on this acrylic so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take these off obviously once you take the films off you know the panels are a lot more vulnerable and from now on you've got to be really careful about um, scratching it up. That only really goes for the top panel. The bottom panel it's uh, inconsequential um, because we're not going to see it. But also you know there's no real need to take the films off the bottom panel <laughs> right now because we don't need to see the for the setup process anyway here we go so we're taking off the rear film and we're going to take off the front film now I mean this is quite scratch resistant stuff you know I don't want to overstate the um, the, the problem 
But obviously, you know, if you drop a screwdriver on it or something like that, you're gonna you're gonna mark it off. Cool, that didn't want to come off. All right, there we go. So there's the panel. You may or may not even be able to see that. I hope you get some reflections on it. So I've lined that top sheet up pretty much as I need it to be lined, well exactly as I need it to be lined up. What I'm just going to do is I'm going to use some sticky tape to temporarily fix the two together. Uh, I would use masking tape, I can't find any masking tape. So I'm going to use probably four bits of, this is uh, electrical insulating tape. Alright, so what we ought to be able to do is lift lift that up and now I just want to kind of more or less by actually holding it up to the light I can do this I can line up the rear acrylic I think that's going to be pretty much close enough and it just has to be close enough so there's uh, a gap underneath the, the two holes that I want to poke through so there you go one two and what we're going to do now is we're going to take a machine screw that's uh, 10 millimeter long by 4 millimeter wide screw with a nut on the other end. And we've got two of these. Okay, so we've got the two screws through the two sheets. I'm going to put the nuts on. Tighten these up, just finger tight. Check that the registration is still what we need. So there you go. Now it doesn't look too much at the minute. What's really important here is that these horizontal lines are as near as you can get it parallel to the edges of the of the sheet. Otherwise, you know, that's something that's quite noticeable later on. So there's two things we need to do now before we're ready to mount the components. The first thing is to trim the edges of this graphic to fit the sheet. Now it's tempting to just take your craft knife and cut along the edges here, but if you do that, that generally doesn't work very well. You, you're going to get a ragged edge here or there, tear, or it's going to tear, or even if you're very careful and very precise, inevitably the paper is going to protrude very slightly. So we're not going to do that. What we are going to do is we're going to turn it over and uh, we're going to take a, a fine pencil along the edges of the board uh, of the um, acrylic using it as a ruler and we're just going to make a faint pencil line. So I've done one side three sides four sides. Now we're going to use that as the guide for cutting and um, we're going to, to cut it we're going to dismantle the panel again, take the graphic out and cut that. We're not going to do that just yet because what I'm going to do first is the next job which is we've got to cut out each of these holes for the components. Now the simple way to do that would be to take the craft knife just maybe do a cross and shove, shove the paper flaps back. Now that doesn't work too well so we're not going to do that, we're going to do the harder but much more satisfactory way. I'm going to take a pin and for each of these holes I'm going to essentially poke a perforated strip around the edge and then punch the disc out. So if I just do one of these as an example, uh, we'll do this one under the enter button. Uh, so I'm just going to start and literally go around the hole. I mean, this is actually very easy. It's just a little bit time consuming. If you're using a, if you're planning on a backlit panel and you're using a double sheet, it's actually a little bit more um, of a pain to do. And I mean that literally because. Uh, you can get a very sore finger by the time you finish the whole panel. So there we go. If I 
hold that up it may be possible that you, you can see a perforated line around there if I show it on the close up but what I'll do now is I'll just take a my sharpie pen that's about the right size and I should just be able to punch that disc out of there there it goes so we've got a nice clean hole there with no waste and uh, we just got to do the same thing for all the other holes and, and we're nearly done. So there we go, we've got nicely, we've got a nicely finished panel, very nearly, with all the holes cut and uh, a bunch of confetti there. We don't need. So the next thing we're going to do is to we're going to cut this uh, graphic down to size. So we're going to remove those bits of sticky tape. Then we're going to take the screws out. Yeah, got to be careful as well all the way not to get dust or paper debris. Obviously between the acrylic and the graphic, otherwise you're going to see it. So when we're putting this back together, you know, it's good to have a hoover on standby and just keep everything nice and nice and clean. And we're going to go to the lines we made on the rear. And we're going to cut along them extremely carefully. Now what I'm suggesting you do here is you're going to cut right, instead of cutting right on the line, cut very, very slightly inside the line. There we go. There it is, so we should have our finished graphic cut down. That's the old one. To size. I'm not even going to bother to remove the backing films from the rear acrylic. Uh, so we put the graphic back on. We're going to put the top sheet back on again. And what you should see is those edges are absolutely perfect. You know, whatever slight imperfections they are in the trimming, you know, they're invisible against this nice laser cut edge. And for all intents and purposes, that's just perfect. You know, absolutely fantastic. The graphics are parallel with the edge of the board. So we can put those nuts back on. Uh, what I'll do is I'll hold the nut with my, my finger and do a little bit past finger tight with the screwdriver. That's the best way. Don't don't tighten anything up too tightly because uh, I mean at worst you can crack the acrylic but before you crack it what you'll start to see is um, in fact you can see it you know if you looked carefully on here you can already see it it's starting to warp the surface and so you get sort of dimples around the around the screws or around the components if you're not too careful. Um, and there we go, it's ready for the components. So what I'll do is I'll just uh, do a representative couple of components. I'll take one of the red square switches and we'll take a rotary. Um, the red one The, this is and this goes for all the other the colours of the, the square buttons. It's got a nut on the back. These these are inserted from the front, and the nut goes on the back. There's also a spring washer. Now you don't really need the spring washer. You know this is uh, these are normally used in industrial applications where you might have vibration and 
the spring washers to keep the thing tight. Now you can you can use it, there's no reason not to use it, but I suggest you use it on the back underneath the nut. So otherwise it's slightly you know it's visible on the front, it'll stand proud of the panel slightly, so we don't we don't really want that. So you take the wires, stick them through to the back, put the components in, perfect fit there, laser, laser cut panel. Put the washer on, oops, I mean, I'm laying the panel on its face there, you probably wouldn't do that because, uh, you know, again, you're risking marking up the front, but uh, there you go. This is for show, we put the, the nut on, and then we just do that nut up, initially finger tight, ultimately, when all the components are mounted, you probably want to go around with a, a spanner of some sort or adjustable spanner. What have I got? Uh, I mean, I've got various spanners here. Uh, these are, I don't know what the sizes of these are, but um, I do them up a little bit past finger tight. Again, not too tight. These have got, these are, you know, plastic components. The threads are plastic anyway, so if you do them up too tightly, you'll strip them. So, that, so that's our first component. I'll do one more. This is one of the rotary knobs. Now these are inserted from, this is uh, the opposite of this one in, in terms of how it's mounted. This is inserted from the rear and it has a nut on the front, so the nut is visible. Um, it also comes with a washer. This is an anti, I don't know what you call it, anti-torque washer or something. It's sort of knobbly. Uh, again, use this on the rear of the panel, so it's not visible. But what is particularly important for the rotary control, because the rotary control is going to want to move in the socket, so this stops it moving essentially. So you stick that on there, uh, you put it through, and this is why we've got the cutouts on the rear panel. The hole on the rear panel is bigger because this component has a short thread on it, and, uh, it, and so it sits in that little hole in the rear panel, and the thread pokes through. And we've got just enough thread to put the nut on. So there it is. Obviously we put a knob on that and uh, it'll look a lot better. We're not, we'll do that presently. You're not going to do it for now. So we've got all the components mounted now. This is the pretty much completed panel. And uh, if I show you around the back, you'll see, I mean, it looks pretty much of a mess. And... Uh, some people might look at that and be a bit intimidated, but really it's just all those two wire connections to the switches um, bundled together. So I've, put, I've bundled them together with a, a few cable ties here, still looking like a bit of a mess at the end. What I'm going to do next is trim all these wires to the, roughly the same length. So there you go, we've got a nice uh, uniform bundle now. This is where you're going to see the, the need for colour coding. Let's get rid of those uh, scraps. Hang on to those, I might use those for something. Now before I do the connecting up to the control board, the next thing I'm going to do, this is a bit unwieldy as it is, so I'm going to mount it somehow. You've got to decide how you want your panel mounted. Uh, there's various options. What I'm going to do for now is I've got this frame, I made this frame, it's just a rough, you know, kind of desktop kind of stand, if you like, for one of the prototype handmade boards. And uh, it's going to be convenient just to, to work with this. So, and the board should sit nicely. So what I'm going to do is just take, uh, in each case, the cup washer and the screw. So that's good enough. We've got a temporary frame with the panel mounted on it. It's got a nice sturdy sort of feel to it. It'll sit on the desktop and we can manipulate it. 
So now we need to look at how to go around the back and connect this up to the Leo Bodner controller board. Now it's about now that you need to think about how you're going to connect up, sorry, how you're going to mount the board. Uh, this is mounted on a plastic kind of, this is the lid of a, of a box actually, this is a box, I think, I think I've got this from home base or somewhere, it's one of those things where you just get little knick-knack boxes and this is just a convenient size so that if you mount the controller on the lid uh, you've got a nice enclosure which is just about, if I show you actually, here's another one, it's just a convenient size to contain a bundle of wires once you've connected up the, the panel to the controller. So, um, so that's what I'm using at the moment. Just I've got it, I've got it around with the board already mounted in there. Uh, the very simplest thing you can do is you can just take a piece of MDF like this one, and uh, you drill holes in it at the corners, and then you can just plant. I mean, just exactly the same way as I've mounted this. You put cable ties through. There's, there's mounted holes at the corners of the Bodner board and so what you've got is it's just sitting on this piece of MDF and all that does is it protects the back of the circuit board so you can't get any short circuits and then you clamp the wire bundle with another cable tie got a couple of holes there for that so that you know you, that's the simplest uh, option obviously the board's left unprotected but you, you'll figure out how you want to mount that so so this is really the last stage in the hardware setup, and uh, it's very straightforward. This Bodner board, it's got these push fit connectors on. So all you got to do is you've got to strip the end of the wire that you're going to insert, and you just kind of twist it so you've got a, the strands aren't kind of floating free. And then what you do is we'll just choose a random connector here. Let's say we're going to choose the um, button 8 and they're labelled on the board so B8 you just find the, um, the connector that's next to that I think it's that one and all you do is you put a screwdriver or a paper clip or something on there you press that thing down you hopefully you can see that moving that's a spring clip so you press that down and then you stick the wire in the hole and push it all the way in you let the spring clip go and it's there, it's connected. And that's all you've got to do. You've got to do it 32 times. Uh, in fact, you've got to do 64 times because uh, there's 32 connectors and 32 grounds. But it's as simple as that. No soldering, no heat shrink, any of that stuff. Um, we're going to start with the rotary controls. This is where the color coding comes into its own. Uh, and also, for the rotary controls, the Remember those little bits of heat shrink to keep these yellow wires as pairs. So I'm going to separate these out. These are the ones we want at the moment. So we've got five rotary controls. So we've got five pairs of these yellow wires. Now the first thing I've got to do is I've got to strip the ends. I'll just do that. You only need to strip about less than a centimetre, half a centimetre, maybe a little bit more. Okay, that's all of those done. So we'll just take them a pair at a time. Again, don't worry if you don't get exactly what I'm saying here. All of this is outlined, well, it's described in great detail in the ebook, or if you don't have the ebook, if you buy a kit, you get a cut down version of the ebook as a construction guide. So it's all in there. Uh, the only stipulation for connecting the rotaries, as I've said before, they need to be connected to adjacent or even pairs, sorry, input 1 and 2, or input 3 and 4, 5 and 6, and so on. So we're just going to start at 1 and 2, and we're going to take uh, our first rotary pair, and we're going to go to button 1 and 2, and it doesn't matter which one goes to 1 and which one goes to 2, that's all taken care of for you. Be careful you connect it to the B1 and not the ground. Each, each of these buttons has got an independent ground. They're, they're not independent, they're all actually connected together, but, but there's, there's a ground connection next, next to each one. Make sure you're connecting the signal 
um, to the signal input. That goes into B1 and the other part of that pair goes into B2. I hope my fingers are not in the way on this clock, they are actually. <laughs> so we'll do the next one, I'm just going to twist the wires together again, making sure we've got a nice it's important to use the right thickness of wire. I've chosen this to be ideal. This is uh, 7 strand, not 0.2 millimeter wire, I think. You get this in the kit, so don't worry about that. There you go. So the next one goes to button 3, which is that one there. Press it down, shove it in let it go and it's done. Next one goes to button 4 so there should be one unused connection in between for the ground. There it goes. So we've got two rotary controls connected already. Da -da -da. Okay, so all the rotary controls are now connected. We haven't connected the grounds, we've only connected the signals. So the last piece of the jigsaw is these green wires. These are also signal wires. We could treat them exactly the same as red wires, which is we just connect each one independently to any signal input, doesn't matter which one. And we will have just enough signal inputs on the board to do that, because we've got 32 signals altogether. But because these are all going to be driving a common function, which is the rotary control shift function, we're going to connect them all together and just connect them to one signal input. So that means we've got a few signals left over. So you can mount some extra switches somewhere and, and plug them in. You've got uh, four spare inputs. And the way we're going to do that, we're going to do it just the same way as we did the wiring of the switches. We're going to strip the ends of these and we're going to twist them together. And then we're going to take one signal from that twisted together bundle and uh, feed it into one of the inputs. So we're going to twist those together with, let's make a, let's take another green wire. We're going to put some heat shrink tube over that. Okay, so we have finally one signal wire for the rotary control push switches. So there we go, we just need to connect that to one of the signal inputs. Every red goes to a signal input, every black goes to a ground input, and uh, we're ready to rock. So that's it, we've done the wiring. We've now got uh, all of these wires connected to the bottom board. And so the next thing to do is to take this over to the FSX PC, plug a USB cable in here, and just make sure that we can see this in the device manager in Windows. So we're about to check out the panel in Windows. First thing we've got to do is plug the controller board into the USB. Now the only setup we've got to do for the Bodner board is we've got to tell it that we've put rotary encoder controls on those first 10 inputs. And we do that with a program called BBI32Config that we download from the Leo Bodner site. And I've only got one Bodner board on this computer, otherwise I would select it from the drop down here. And we're looking at, this should be fairly self-explanatory, this section has is labelled rotary encoders and each pair of inputs is listed and set to off. So we know that we've connected a rotary encoder to each of the first five pairs. So all we do is we go to the list and we click one to one instead of off. So I'm just doing that. 
don't worry about what one to one means just click it and that's all you need to do and uh, as soon as you click it that's changed on the board and you didn't worry that you have to do this every time you unplug the bottom of the board from the USB this uh, remembers it on the board so it's a one to one shot only so that's all we need to do and it's set up now and so the next thing we've got to do is we're going to go to the Windows control panel we're going to look for uh, devices and printers I believe that shows us all the game controllers we should see a game controller called button box interface that's the BBR32 port so do right click and select game controller settings and then properties okay we now have a test page and what we need to do to completely check out this board is simply go around the board press the buttons and check that we see a button press event in the Windows test page. So for example if I click the menu button we get button 20. Now it doesn't matter which button is mapped to which button number that's irrelevant because uh, when we come around to programming it we just don't need to know about that. So let's just go around the board. Let's do all the black ones first. So we'll do CDI, OBS, MSG, FPL, VNAV, PROC, Menu, Direct to, Clear, Enter. They all work, so the two green ones. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Two red ones. Up. Yep. Yeah. Down. Yep. Yeah. The nav ident. That's a latching switch, so that stays on. Then it's off again, so that works. The CV button. Yep. Yeah. The cursor button, yep. That's everything except the rotary control. So let's go to the bottom left rotary control. Left gives us a momentary button click, button 5. Right gives us button 6. Push gives us button 11. The right hand rotary control, left gives us button 2. Right gives us button 1. Push gives us button 11. Now don't forget that's the same button as the push on the other rotary control because we wired them all together. The ADF control left button 7, right button 8, push button 11, VOR left button 4, right button 3, push button 11, gyro left button was it 9, right is button 10, push is button 11. That is the board completely checked out. Now what does that mean? That means that all those connections we made, which were exclusively solderless connections, made with the heat shrink only, those work uh, completely reliably, end to end. We didn't have to do anything to fix up any of them. And uh, all the connections that we made to the Bodner board with the push fit connectors, which I did only once and I didn't check them out as I went, they all work first time. So that tells us something about the reliability of this construction method. And that's really it. Everything else from here on in is software. It's essentially programming up the functions of these buttons and rotary controls, just like you would do for your SciTech or your VR Insight control panels. So there we are. That's what it takes to build one of the Almost Aviation kits. And I hope I've demonstrated that it's well within the grasp of anybody with a little bit of patience. There's nothing too technical and as I've shown you can do it without soldering if you want to. I'm not going to go into the software setup because I've already covered that in I think a couple of videos and I'll put links to those below so you can check that out if you want.